Thanks for tuning in. Before we start the show, we have an announcement to make. We got gear for you. Yeah, due to popular demand, we've got some proper nice t-shirts with our famous logo on the front. We've even got two star with caps. We've got the trucker cap and the best-selling uh, lazy slouch adjustable cap. And more importantly, we've got a beer mug, a whiskey glass, and a coffee mug to go. So you can be listening to our podcast no matter what you're doing, whether you're having a cigar at night or you're on your way to work. So you can pick up whatever you like there. Mike, where can they find it? All you got to do is go to freakstrength.com slash shop, freakstrength.com. Click on the shop. Once you click on shop, pictures are going to show up of our merchandise. Click those pictures right there. There you have it. Mike and Brooker show merchandise right there. Scroll right down. Order whatever you can to support the show. Show everyone that you are avid listeners of the Mike and Brooker show. Yeah. Show, you, show yourself as an original disciple of the show. And guys, we just want to thank you once again for the love and support. It means the world to us. But in order for us to keep doing this, we need to keep receiving feedback. So no matter what it is, good, bad, or ugly, we're open to everything. We want to keep delivering the best information possible. So thanks once again for all the love, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, guys. And we are rolling. All right, so we have a very special guest on today, <laughs> Michael Hope. He is a physical therapist. Now. I, some of you may know his name because of Elite and, and God knows Buddy has dropped his name hundreds, hundreds of times. Um, I've, I've known of Michael for years. We've spoken, uh, geez, I, I don't know, a handful of times. And then just this year when the Cardinals came, came to New York, we actually met for the first time and, and we, we hit it off. Uh, so I am super, super pumped to introduce this wealth of information to, I, 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 guys, I, I really can't, I, I can't say enough awesome things about, about this guy's knowledge. Uh, last, last night, he, or a couple of nights ago, we were talking, and he says, you know, why, why do you even want me on here? You know, like, what, what, what do you want from me? I, I, I don't get it. And I said, you know, we talk about this book, uh, Chop Wood, Carry Water. And it's literally just 10 years, do the shit you're supposed to do. And all of a sudden, things start. You start learning more and more and more. So, one of the things that's incredibly sexy about Michael and his approach is the simplicity of it, right? I one of the one of the big things that I took away was it wasn't just about doing three sets of ten a couple times a week. He goes, oh, well, yeah. I mean, okay. That, that at the end of, at the end of the week, you know, you do that three times a week. That's nine sets of ten that you only accomplish. But if you do one set of ten every hour, every two hours, all of a sudden you hit nine sets in a single day, and you're not even fatigued. And that's how you get more more repetition. And so I took that concept as a holy shit. This guy looks at things from an entirely different level. So I, Mike, you've been a huge influence to me <laughs> since uh, since since I got back from Pitt ten years ago. Uh, and bro, I'm, I'm just, I'm pumped to have you on the show, dude. No, thank you. I'm, I'm made it. It's, it's, it's awkward for me. I never talked to anybody. So, <laughs> so I hope this goes well. So, yeah. <laughs> so Michael, do you work in as part of a private facility or? So I own my own company. Okay. Um, so I have four offices in central New York. And, uh, it, it's just primary orthopedics, backs, shoulders, knees. You know, um, broad spectrum from total hip replacements, the elderly population, two, two young athletes. Um, when, I, when I first started where I am currently, it was, it, was it was a chronic back clinic. So we typically saw people who didn't get better locally um, or, or from surrounding, you know, an hour, an hour and a half away would come in. So I, that was a good starting point because you saw so many bad people who had failed therapy, failed conservative care and other interventions. So, so I started realizing that not everybody gets better. And then you start weeding out like what is, what is truthful versus what is maybe just a path that you go down. Um, that, that it's not all it's, all it's cracked up to be. So when the people brought me here, I came here because they would lecture over the country and they were talking about how wonderful they treated patients and how, how good the outcomes were. So when I show up, I realized that's not true. They, they, they go to the seminars and they teach you this mechanical mechanical therapy. They teach you that component. 
So if I'm selling you that component, I don't talk about this over here. So when I show up at the clinic, there's a lot of this over here. And that's when I started venturing off to like more of a stabilization program or, or strengthening became, became my, my secondary calling. Even though that was my primary calling, I thought I'd be a strength coach. That was my intent. I never wanted to be a therapist at, at all. I really um, thought I will graduate college and I will work with athletes the rest of my life, to be honest with you. And unfortunately, my first PT job paid 42000 and my first job to be a assistant strength coach paid 18000 <laughs> <laughs> So I couldn't live with my parents anymore. So I took the, I took the PT job. And then it's just kind of, you know, I, I've all, I've, it's kind of funny. You guys probably get it too. Every therapist wants to be a strength coach or inter, interject into the strength community. And every strength coach will tell you how to do rehab. <laughs> right it's 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 true and i i come from a classroom i sat in my classroom i could tell you there's not one kid in my classroom who understood exercise and and when i was in pt school i i i was they used to call me like like where's the myth like he was never there i was never in pt class i was always in the university of pittsburgh football team weight room so i figured that made sense to me like PT did not make sense to me. Like I'm, I'm watching these exercises. I'm like, I don't know how that applies to, to what my end game will be. So, so I had to pass the curriculum obviously and I would study, but my true learning curve was always, always looking at the weight room. Um, and so I guess, I guess we are, we are, we come. So I was never, you know, I was never in like, I was never much in the softer feel your touchy stuff. So I, be, I came from a, from an exercise background. So I've always tried to stay with that as a, as a clinician. But, but as I was telling you, ironically, my, my, why I wanted to be a strength coach was when I was 19, I trained professional football players in, in footwork and hand drills. So I, at that time I was teaching the University of Pittsburgh and I was teaching West Virginia University and I would teach pros in the summer. And so like the, like the Steelers, New York Jets, and it was funny because we had a guy for the Steelers, a guy named Tunch Ilkin, who was uh, a really good lineman. He was a right tackle. And he made this video of drills we were doing. And, and Tunch Ilkin, because the name rhymed so well with Tunch Punch, they became known as the Tunch Punch Drills. <laughs> so they circled the NFL. And, and the gentleman, like Tunch gets credit, the other guy that I used to work with, unfortunately passed away when I was younger, he gets credit and I love because so many of the drills like we came up with were like mine and this other guys. Tommy and Mike is now the strength coach of the Jaguars made a video of how to do the drills. Like they made this big ladder called the, the punching ladder, which I remember at the University of Pittsburgh like invent stupid drill. And so there's, it's funny, so there's not like a, probably a college pro that doesn't use that model that I taught when I was 19 years old. So when I, when I, there was, but at that time, making money in sports wasn't popular. So I'm 19, I'm teaching West Virginia University, gives me basically a job. I teach pass proing during the season to the, to the, to the uh, defensive linemen and linebackers. And all off season, I teach defensive linemen and defensive linemen basically how to become better throwers, footwork, and punching. And so I was, I was doing Bob Ward. Dallas Cobble doing this. So, we're the, so I was the first person at college to do it, but I, I saw Bob Ward was doing it. So I, I, I was working at that time, Danny Nascento, who was working with, obviously come out of Bruce Lee's background. We were, I was training and we were talking and I showed him what I was doing. And he was like, that's much better than what we're doing because you choose football center versus truly martial arts. They were still teaching, we'll say to the Dallas Cowboys. And we were teaching the Pittsburgh Steelers, University of Pittsburgh and West Virginia, how to truly become a better football player. And now everybody does it. Every every play. I've I've been I've been at the University of Buffalo and I've been at the Cleveland Browns, hearing people teach like my concepts when I was 19 years old, and I was like, well, that's not right. Like that's not how I would do it. But so it's funny, like to see your ideas. And I didn't understand copyright. I didn't understand. We made a video for Todd Black, Ron Blackledge, the line coach of the Steelers, and that just got copied and sent out all over all over the place. And because I was so young. It, it didn't make sense to me. And that's so I thought that would be my future, right? This is what I'll do. And I'll do this and I'll, I'll become a strength coach and then I'll hybrid. 
And I was fortunate at West Virginia University offered me a job to do that. They offered me a job to stay on and coach. And then the University of Pittsburgh did. So when I was 21, by the time I was 20 when I graduated, and it was strange because I had offers to be the Division I curriculum or program and, and multiple offers, and I was working with pros. So everything kind of came really early, and I took none of them. I became a therapist, right, to then just be miserable. And then, <laughs> and so, so, that was, so that was like my, my would-be wannabe. So, so, so I think where I was successful early on is I understood strength training, right? I work at West Virginia with Alan Johnson. We do a very different program than the University of Pittsburgh does. Um, my buddy at the time I trained at uh, Penn State, that time they won their national championships. My last year, we played Notre Dame for national championship. So it's funny, I see all these programs and all the way they do things, and yet we're the least talented and probably the most successful at that time at West Virginia in, in my last years. And, I, and, and it was great because coaches would come to me and they would say, like, this is our problems, and how do you, how do you incorporate this? And it was funny because coaches had no idea how to really teach full work or punching. They knew how to, really weren't good at teaching pass crawling or, or rushing. They would tell you how to punch, but they didn't teach you how to punch and how to generate force and how to hit and move. And so when I come in, all of a sudden they, they sat down and they said, we don't understand this at all. You know what? You just teach it. Here's your locker. Here's your whistle during practice. Here's your periods. Everybody comes over to you. You, chit, you do whatever you want. Whistle blows, they go back. And then I watch game film. And it was, it was really strange. I mean, I'm 19 years old. I'm sitting in coaches' meetings, looking around, thinking, like, I'm still, I got to go. Like, I have class. Like, I got to get out. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was a really, it was, like, looking back, I was very fortunate to be put in that situation only because I was good at martial arts, right? And then Buddy Morris loved me because I could, I could teach martial arts at the University of Pittsburgh. West Virginia loved me because I could do that. And then, and then the pros, and then you find out once you got a name, then people can make phone calls, right? So I would, that navigated me eventually into the, you know, that I met up with Buddy later in my life. And then I met with Paula Quinn, right? So I go to see Paula Quinn. And then I go down to West Side Barbell, spend time with those guys. So I'm, we're talking the early 2000s when I'm doing this, when this is all elementary, right? When, when, when. West Side Barbell hasn't really taken off in the, as, as like they are now, right? Like the, I'm sure they were in, the, in, the, in the, the strength world, but they weren't the, the, the carryover to sports training. And then, and then that evolves a little more. I start writing for those guys. And, and then I start, you know, I think I introduced McGill to the West Side Barbell. They never heard of him. Like, I know they didn't. Like, cause I, I was, so, so all of a sudden, like, it's a chain of events. He catches on. Then we had to do a big seminar. I, I started working with the Franco's people, right? Joe, Joe's people catch on. Martin Rooney, they're still friends at this time, I think. They're still hanging out at, uh, at their original place with um, – uh, who's, who's the original? Uh, Parisi's. Uh, yeah, Parisi's, right? So these guys, so these guys are just about they, – they're going to or just making their 40-yard their, – their, their video for the combine. So, so I had started before that working with, working with all these guys and going to see them and – and trying to figure out why they are, who they are, and then trying to help them. And so I was fortunate. I, was, I got to work with athletes from all over the world that I never knew. I just heard phone calls from them. I would take a phone call, and they would tell me their problem, and I, I would try to address it. And I think, so from that's where my approach always got. Like, I never saw these people. They would tell me their problem. So I would always go back to programming. Like, what, what are you doing? And how can I help you? So, so I didn't have this vast array of tools to say, well, you can do this and this and this. So my, my, I think my skill set was just being simple and saying, take out that, put this in, don't change that. You can't change that till you have this success. And, and that, has, that has carried me through, I think, to where I am. Because I always thought, if everything goes away in my clinic and the last thing I have is the ability to exercise, I'm comfortable with that. I, I, don't, I don't even have like, I don't have an ultrasound machine. Like, I don't use STEM. Like, I, don't have, I don't have any of those things. I truly use exercise as, as, as my modality of choice. As, as why are gym people successful? Because that's their modality of choice, right? You use it more than, you know, in a better framework than most therapists do. When, when I met Carlos Santana, he was writing books and all the therapists were going to Carlos Santana seminars, right? But no one had an idea how to put Carlos Santana's stuff into rehab because they were therapists, right? 
you're just sitting there. And you're like, I don't like that's not Australia Grace. I don't I don't know where to start. Right? It's, <laughs> it's 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 funny. So I think what happened? Many strength coaches and, and power athletes got frustrated with therapists because they start asking them questions and they give them or they go to therapy and they, they're watching they're doing stuff. They're like, this is this won't help me, right? I. I mean, you take a guy who benches 600 pounds and you're telling him, we're starting with dumbbells, we're going to do two sets of 10 with four pounds. Yep. He's like, I could, I could do this like probably under surgery. Like, I, you know, I could still, and I think that, that's so, so when people called me, they had been frustrated with what they were getting. And, and I was fortunate. I, I, was, I was successful with a lot of, I think I was successful. They don't, I mean, maybe not. They just stopped calling me. But <laughs> I think, I think I, I think I helped them out. And, um, but I learned a lot. I learned, I think that's a beautiful thing about this. I learned more from the people who would call me than I think, than, than I learned, than, than I was giving them, right? Because you, you start learning what people do and why did they fail and how do other people approach people. And so I think I learned so much more from all my failures, all my other patients' failures, because I just would have listened to, to, the, to the thought process. Um, and the same with, like, when I would go to Louis Simmons guys, right? So I would hear Louis Simmons talk and, and I was young and, I understood biomechanics and like, and like, I was like, well, I don't, that's not right. I mean, it may work. You may guys may think it works, but that's like a destructive thing to do. Like a good morning into a squat with maximal load can't be good on your back if you fail. And now everybody, you know, now they're like, oh, that's stupid. But listen, in early 2000, it wasn't, it was a max exercise, right? <laughs> and, and so, so when, so, you know, the reverse hyper was always a big flexion moment arm with a huge amount of tremendous load on the spine. And I would say like, understand, like, if you do that to people, that's, that's, that may not be the best choice, but because Louis was so, so revered and, and for rightfully so, when he said it, it sounded, it sounded really good. When, when I come in all of 190 pounds, like in West Side Barbell, thinking, Dude, I don't, you guys are going to make shirts this small to fit me. <laughs> like no one's listening. No one's going to listen to me. But because of my background, I think I had a little bit of common sense. So we could weave it where I could say, well, I wouldn't do this for a bit. I would go back and do that. And, and, and so I did. I learned, I learned a lot by, by listening to, to the Dave Tates and the people of the world and other strength coaches who would call me from other colleges. Because I think you guys would agree. What happens is most athletes who don't get better fall through the cracks. And that's the ones I always like to work with, the ones who fall through the crack. The, the easy people who care, right? They're going to yeah. get better. They'll get better anywhere they go. They just, a young kid shows up, he'll get bigger, stronger, and most problems go away when all that occurs. It, it's just when, they're, when they're, they're frustrated and the trainer gives up or the strength coach or whatever. And I think that's why I most would ask the people I like to talk to and try to help. Um, when, when you come across those people, what do you, what do you think is overlooked? Right. Like what, what, how yeah. do you, how do you, how do you go back and say, all right, well, Hey, let's, let's go back to square one and, and start piecing this shit together. What's yep. your process with that? I think, let's just take like a, like one of my patients now. So he's a big dude, strong guy. And, and so he always has a cuff injury and he and eventually, you know, for all these powerlifters right around 40 some years old, they all fall apart. Right. It's just a matter of when, like they, you know, so it's, it's the laws of, of loading. Right. But if, if you, if you load, eventually things wear out. So, so they would come in and, and we'll say, um, it's, it's, so they say, okay, my, you know, my shoulder hurts, blah, blah, blah. And biomechanically, they don't even see that they have a problem. So when they pick their arms up, like they're standing one shoulders up in the air and they're like, well, that's, that's normal, right? I'm like, not, not, you're not having good biomechanics. So what they would keep doing is they would do their max work, right? They would always do like long weave arms. So they keep, they keep, and then they would do like Y's or T's or W's because someone said those are really good exercises. So what happens, they perpetuate the problem because they're not sitting in a lower, a lower place, right? So when you have that, you can't be out here in space when your strength is only good down here. Like that sounds, that sounds stupid for a guy who can lift all this load. But I say, you can't lift the load now because every time you do it, you keep getting sore and worse. And I said, if that worked, you would never, you would never come see me. So the reason you're here is you have failed. Your approach has failed. So we can both agree that you're not, you're not good at this. So let's try mine for a little bit. I said, so let me take away some of the stuff you do and we'll add it back in, but just buy into me. And they kind of get it. It's kind of funny, right? It's, it's when you say that you have failed yourself miserably, why would you keep listening to you? And I think, I think that's when they finally, 
when they, it finally hits them, right? Um, that, okay, what is it? Then you need a plan, right? You need a plan that they can buy into, but you can't have your plan so far off base from what they do. That's the other thing. From strength athletes, right, or speed athletes, you have to make sure you're, you're, you're giving them what they want and minimizing the irritability. And some guys will still press, and I'm like, here's the deal. You can do that, but understand this. It may take longer. So I have this little rule of thumb with athletes, right? If you have pain, it goes to a five. Five would be my shutoff point. It's just a random number that sounds good, but it allows them some latitude. Because if you can go, if you go from a two to a five and then it, it quiets down, then you, you give them something to do, right? But I say to them, if every time you, you work out and it starts going six or seven and you're waking up and your morning two is now a three or four, you're getting worse. So you're no longer training to improve. You're actually regressing. So you have, so you have to take that out. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very amicable about saying, let's give and take on this a little bit. And then, and then because now they're, they're, they're a willing participant, right? And so then they buy into it. And I think when, they, so when their pain starts coming down a little bit, then they definitely buy into it, right? When they see the first sign of success. And then I think then you, then you have them. Then you can bring them, then you bring them back up and then start bringing the loads back in. The positions that were bad before, we would introduce them. But, but I don't change a lot. Like I'm, I'm very consistent. So if I find one thing that works, I repeat that over and over. It's like Monday looks like Tuesday, looks like Wednesday. Because I think any experiment, if you have two variables, you have two, two, two wrongs or two rights. Yep. So if I have one variable, so I'm a builder, right? I have one thing, I put my next thing in, I put my next thing in. So I, I, I add. But for people, when I was younger, I always wanted, I always wanted to say, you're going to get your money's worth when you say, right? I'll give you everything. Then I come back and I hate my guts. And they're like, you made me worse. So it's like, why not give them one thing to build success, minimize the chance of, of, of failure, and then they start to buy into you, right? Because the game is buying into you. When someone seeks you out, they're coming to you with a problem thinking you're my guy, right? So they've somewhat bought into you already, but you have to also bring that to, to, to fruition. And, and, and be successful, right? Because now there's many geniuses that you can seek out. And, and are they, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know who's good or bad anymore, right? I like some people, I only know what I do in my four walls. But I'm comfortable enough, if you shuffle my four walls, you'd look and go, that makes sense. Like, that, does, that doesn't look stupid, right? And, and, um, and, and so I, I, think, I think slowing it down, like, I think... I, I have another girl, she's a, she's a bodybuilder, right? She can't, she can't pick her arms. It kills her to do this, right? And she, it kills her, but she's a bodybuilder. So she likes volume and she likes shaping, right? So it's funny. I made her do the exercise lying down. It doesn't hurt. I was like, you can do them. You just got to do it there. And she's like, but why get stronger? I said, you can't get stronger and have pain. They don't go together. But I know one thing, if that doesn't hurt, it's a starting point, right? It's better than what you were doing. And then she's like, and then the light turns on. You're like, okay, that makes sense. I said, it's not forever. It's just a starting point. This is, this is we, we will get you back to who you are and who you want to be. But, but please, just, just follow some rules for a while, right? And, and I think the rules have to, to, to take you down the pathway. I was fortunate. I just had a professional baseball player come see me, and he saw a therapist. And, and he's smart. He, he really gets training and, and he, he understands exercise really well. And the path that he, he was on by the advice would never meet his problem because someone just gave him a bunch of stuff that everybody says. And he laughed and he goes, you know, he's not like you right now. He goes, you're the first therapist I've seen that didn't, didn't do a screening on me. Like he goes, you didn't screen me. He goes, why not? I said, I said, let me just show me what you can't do and show me how you do it. Then maybe I'll figure it out from there, right? <laughs> and the funny thing, the two things he had knee pain with coming out of a squat and stepping up. He goes, it kills me. So as soon as we change his mechanics, the pain went away. So like, I, this, the only thing I know is like, that's the thing I look at. Yeah, what don't you, what works? And, and if I can change the way you do it, at least I'm on the pathway of, of, of changing your, your, and then as soon as you change the, their pain, then he starts to buy into it, right? He's like, well, why doesn't someone, like, I don't know why the people don't do it. I, but you'll, you'll see this with, I've seen, I have a video of a lot of real young athletes, it's funny. 
if you start them a body weight squat, they look really good, right? Then you put a bar on, they look really good still. And then you put a load on them. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, at a certain weight, they fall apart. So you wouldn't see that unless you started to train with them. What is the, I call their breaking point, right? So they go up to a certain weight. Let's say it's, you know, 200 pounds on a squat. At 200 pounds, they, they start having a problem, right? They, they either mechanically break down or they have a pain. But at once, 185, they don't. So I'm like, you can train. You can squat as much as you want um, from a two-inch box or box or whatever you want up to 185. And it sounds so stupid, right? It sounds so stupid and simple. But you'd be, you'd be amazed how people keep doing the same thing thinking, why? Yeah, it's common sense. Yeah, and you can't sell common sense because it's boring. It, yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this is one of my, I mean, obviously it's very effective of what you're doing and it's very individualized because you're actually listening to the people and you're not relying on a pre-programmed screening or something like this. Now, why do you think that's your approach? Is that because you've had a non-traditional education in, I, I, in physical therapy? Yeah, or? I, th I think because it started, I think coming from a, sitting in a weight room all the time, watching people move and, and, and the more that they that they would get they would something like as speed changes so does so, so does form right and you watch a runner and then you watch a strength athlete right so then you watch the point where's the breakdown because a lot of people you know you're like you go to a gym a lot of guys look great hitting a heavy bag they just can't hit another person because when when you actually have to do that thing it doesn't look good and and so i so i think it's like what what is the one thing that stands out that you can't do that I can help you with? Not the many things, but the one, you know, it's like the lowest pit lowest hanging fruit. So maybe I'm not good. And I just pick the lowest hanging fruit and get lucky a lot of times. <laughs> right. But if I can clean that one problem up and I can clean the next problem up. And, and I think where I, because I'm not, I don't, I don't I, like, there's a young kid, his name's Adam Raskowski. who works for me. He is so freaking smart. Like, like I look at him, like he, he is so good at this stuff. He's so smart. He confuses himself sometimes. He's so smart. And I, I, I always say, dude, just simplify this for the love of God. Cause I don't know what you're saying. Like I'm a therapist. Like I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, uh, so, so I'm like, tell me again, what, what the hell they can't do. And then I'll figure out how to do it better. Right. And, and, um, and I think, I think that's it. Cause I don't want it to be complicated. And I, I always, and he always, we, you know, I, I always say like to this, I said, here's the deal to me, all movement to concert. So when I hear your concert, I, I, it's hard for me to figure out what music is not good. So when I say, okay, for your shoulder, I said, you know, move your arm. And I'm like, okay, you're moving it, you're biomic, you're throwing it. So that's the concert. So I'm like, okay, scapula, you're okay. I hear you, you play your sound, you're fine. Deltoid, you look okay, you're strong, you're fine. Lower trap, you're good, you're fine. Rotator cuff, you, my friend, you're out of sync. So I turn around and say, okay, if I just fix that one part and I go back to my concert and my concert looks good, I'm okay with that, right? And I know people talk about the big toe and the push off and all those things, right? But I know one thing, if you, if you wash and wax your car every day and you never say, oh, by the way, that Ferrari does not have an engine. That's why it doesn't run, but it looks pretty. It's the one single thing, right? It's the, the engine. So I will say the rotator cuff, make sure the engine's running well, right? And pull them out, look at the parts of it, and then put them back in. Then you can pull the scapula out, do the parts, put them back in. But I think if you, if you just make it so complicated, and, and I think you get loose sight of it, right? No one builds construction. They lay the foundation. They lay the block, right? And, and from there, if it starts to tip or go bad, you just go backwards a little bit. And, and from that, I've been successful because each, I've fixed each part in its individuality, and then I put it back into the concert. And lo and behold, the concert sounds really good now, and it doesn't hurt. So, so I, 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 have, I have a similar way of, of doing things. And it's not like I learned under you or anything like that. It's yeah. just, you know, we, we've had conversations. And, and I know I have, I have a couple of pro pitchers that will experience elbow pain when they're throwing. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm no biomechanist in the sense specific to pitching, right? Like, I'm not a pitching right. coach. Like, that's, that's right. not my thing. But I can look at someone, say, well, it seems as though 
something is out of sync, like the concert, like you're, you're listening to the orchestra. It's just not, they don't sound good together. There's something off with this entire movement. Let me take this and put this here. Let's, you know, whatever the hell it is. Yep. And it seems to address some issues. Now, does that happen with everyone? Can I make someone throw harder by addressing that? No, but for whatever reason, if I can adjust an arm angle or if I could stop the hip from opening up too soon, it stops the arm from hurting. Um, my question with you is now, if someone's in pain, you're yeah. addressing the movement, you're addressing the strength, but how do you get them out of pain? Right. So are you, are you doing any kind of soft tissue work? Are you doing right? What, what, what is yeah. your, what is your modality to just, Hey, we got to stop this pain. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny, right? Cause, cause in some cases I will. Well, in, in most pitchers, the good thing is they, they take away pitching, right? So you, you take away the element of irritability. So that's the first thing that, that for most, most athletes, you, you can stop it. But like you said, if you figured out mechanically, do they fatigue and they drop out of the slot, they call it, right? There's, so so, so if, I, if, I, if, I can, if I can improve where, the, where the, their deficits are and, and, and then put it back in, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. But if they, start, if, they, if they continue with the irritability of the, of the cock and boom, 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 you're right, you keep, you keep it going. And I think, I think one is, like you said, you address, you address the, the volume of throwing, bring it back. But I do, I truly use exercise. So, so classic example is they're already exercising, right? They're doing the rotator cuff and they're doing that. So something it sounds so stupid. Like you, you, you're going to look at this and go, that, that can't be that. It, 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 it's, it's stupid, right? Many kids will come in and they're doing all this stuff. So if, let's just say external rotation, right? They'll do it. And they'll just they'll go bang. And every time you ask them, like it hurts. Like, yeah, it hurts. It hurts every time I do it. Every time I do it, right? Does that hurt? Yep. Does that hurt? No. Doesn't hurt. No. So, okay, so, so can you guess? That's your, that's your end game, right? That's all the further you get to go because they were. And the same thing, they would do that because every video has it. Every, every, every workout has those things. But if you think about it, you just keep banging it, it just hurts. And, and once you, you take it away, right? If you do it this way or sign like, you limit the motion, limit the, the range, and say that's all you get to work your cuff work in. That's it. So you started actually addressing the strength by putting them in a plane that's safer. Now, let's say let's say it hurts all the time, right? And you want to get that accomplished. We'll just without modalities, right? So there's there's still a range in which they can safely move. And so the goal is bring on the pain. That's a little bit. That's a lot of it. Take it away. So what I'll do is I'll say, here's the deal. This, this is again stupid. You can do ten of these every two hours. And so that way you're going to get basically fifty or sixty or up to maybe hundred a day. But here's the deal. Every time you're done, you can't get worse. And then you, you add it again and again and again. So it's a volume base. Because every time they went to therapy, they would go through the whole therapy session. And they got worse. They got worse. They got worse. So I said, the worst thing is you start with this. And then it get worse. And you start with like a serratus anterior or something for the scapula, right? And because you just break it up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, it's getting information. It's learning a program all over a neurological, say, program. But not at the level of stress. And then you, then I bring them back, and and I and I, so I have a student right now, and I I tell them you can do anything you want, but you have no access to modalities, and they just stare. They're like, like, I, what do you mean? I'm like, funny now, isn't it? Now you have to actually think about what you're going to do. Um, I I I have I have um I don't know the ASTM stuff, right? So. So I'll cage like for, for certain things. I have never never done it on the shoulder. Like I never. I, I've never rubbed the shoulder, like, right? Like, I don't. I just strengthen them up. I have people come to me, and they're like, you're going to rub me? I'm like, no. Do I look like I'm going to rub you? I, I say, I'm like, but there's people who do that for a living, right? There, there's massage people. I'm, I said, go find one or, or find you whatever, right? That's just not me. And, uh, and there's a chiropractor, God bless him, in town. Like, he, 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 he always does it. That's what he does now. And it's, it's funny because every once like, a, he'll, he's a nice enough guy. He'll send me his, his, all of his patients. Like, it doesn't don't get better. And I always exercise him, right? And, he, and so I think there's something to be said for picking the right program, the right volume, and then putting it all together properly. And, and sometimes it's, it's that's, my, that's my thing. It's, it sounds so stupid. But I've been really successful doing that stupid little thing over and over Again, like my baseball player, like I, I, I fixed his, his mechanics, 
And he, like, even he's like, when you're going to, like, when you're going to bring out the magic? I was like, brother, you just had the magic. Meaning like, I got nothing else. <laughs> like, like, the only magic was the conversation we had to listen to you, to tell me when you do these following things, they hurt. I change them, they stop hurting. So we're on the path. At least you're training now. You're training with minimal to no discomfort. And it's a crazy thing. He's trying to figure out how to use his lower half in, in, in his linkage system with rotation, right? So I think he has a company who helps him understand his force plate, uh, single foot production, force velocity, blah, blah, blah. And so they have him do like, like, a, like a one or two step med ball throw to, to get single foot ground contacts with acceleration to increase his rotation strength. And um, he's a pretty big kid. And I said, I said, I said, I said, I said you know, it's funny. I said, dude, I don't know if I'm right. I said, I know one thing. The thing you're doing is never going to help you. Never. And he's like, why? I said, I said, you are so strong. When you do your rotation strength, you're way out here. I said, you're an arm rotator. I said, I said, to me, I'm going to step back, see if you can see me. Ready? I said, so here's the deal. With rotation sports, I said, especially batting, I said, I said, you hold the ball here. It's like, it's like, I said, all your goal is to generate force from here, right? I said, so when you come out, like you're classically trained, I said, it's your arms that throw it. I said, if you look at your, even hitting, if, if my med ball is here, when well, my goal is to force through my bottom and it's just, it just it pulls through here. I said, that's where your force generation comes from. I said, that'll increase the, the torque. And all of a sudden, it's so funny. You now he's had pitching coaches. I mean, he's batting coaches. I'm sorry. And I'm like, that seems so simple. Just move it in and truly use your hips. Take your arms out of it. And he's like, I can basically throw a ball through a wall. I said, I'm sure you can. But now with your hips, you can't. You throw <laughs> with your arms. Right now, there's no screening for that, right? They're just looking at him and go, that's just not good. But if you look at martial artists, what do they do? Very, very small torques, right? So I think we got from, from over and over, he, the longer he got through here, the more he got used to being really good with his arms. Once he came here and had to, had to generate this force rotation through batting, all of a sudden, like the light switch turned on and, and he goes, it's, like, it's funny, like, I'm like, dude, like, that is stupid, though, right? That's such an easy thing. I'm like, that's not a genius. Like, like, it's not. It's like, there, just do that, and I think you'll be okay. So he, he called me and hit, and he goes, he goes, it's going better. Cause it's, it's, a, it's a mechanical habit that he hasn't bought, you know, got into. But, but I think that's just it. Like, how can it be just that simple, right? I'm like, well, because it can be if you just do that thing bad, right? And, and so, um, yeah, I think um, I think I think we're good at overthinking, right? Well, and as you said, I mean, it's not sexy and it's hard to sell. Now, my question to you is, Michael. I mean, obviously, you build rapport with these guys and, and yeah. ladies with understanding them and, and trying to keep the program as simple as possible. Do they keep coming back, even though the no. program is? They don't keep coming back. Is that because no. you get them better them. quickly? Yeah, or you don't, I want, don't them? want them. So my pride is getting rid of you. Right, like okay. that's like that's the real thing, right? Like mm -hmm. I, so like I was thinking, like I've treated, so so a normal day for me is like two or three new people, and then about 12, 12 follow follow-ups. So if you look at just me looking at you every day, there's about fifteen people, right? So when you do that, I mean, so I'm seeing like, I'll well, see like forty, four hundred, five hundred. So I, I have about nine or nine, nine, ten, or eleven thousand patients that I've seen. Just like me treating you start, you know, for the most part, start to finish. And, um, and I, I know, and so the whole goal was like that you don't come back. Like I, I had a, I had a business company said, well, you would just do better if you seem longer and have them come back later. I'm like, well, why would I do that? That's, <laughs> that just means I'm not, I'm not successful. And they're like, no, no, sure. no, no. I just thought you become more successful, create dependence, yep. not independence. So I think, and I tell them once you, once you get into tools, right. Then, then you have like your exercise, your exercise Rolodex. You just pull your Rolodex out three or four weeks here, three or four weeks here, and you just roll through stuff, right? And you just take those guys in and out. But I always say, here, when it goes bad, wherever you are in your training is not where we started. Go back to what we started with. Because you're, you're, at, the, you're at the end game, right? The end game of exercise always looks different than the beginning of the game. So your plan now is if you fall apart, go back to what we started with. And, and, and go over again. And sometimes like everything, right? Sometimes they start tearing more or they become, they, they over volume or whatever. And, and they start migrating backwards. But I think, 
And so some of the people will call me, I'll, I'll tell them, just change this, stop that. And, and it goes pretty, it goes pretty well um, with that. With my back patients, I tell them, you know, I say, you're, you're basically a patient for a life of yourself. My goal is to figure you out, help you, move you forward, but give you a plan for yourself. Like, I, I, I really, like, I, it's kind of funny. I'm not, a, I'm not proud of repeat business, right? I get them. I get family members. I get other stuff. But sure. you think about like why like what why did you not pick this up? Like I did a really poor job of educating you. And and so when you think about it, if you're educating them, you do want to keep it simple, right? You want something that they can grasp onto and and go, okay, these are my lessons of life. And you're like, yes, I think if you do this, I'm not saying you won't have a problem, but at least you start to 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 help yourself. I mean, you guys are smart. Back pain is still really bad, right? I mean, it it it, it no one's improving it. I mean. There's more therapists, more chiropractors, everybody. Everybody has an answer for back pain. And why, why does everybody have a billion dollar business? And I don't, I tend not to treat new backs. I tend to treat chronic, so greater than three months. So that's where I tend to see a lot of my patients coming from, right? And they're, they're little people. I mean, when I say like people can't get out of a chair, right? You can't, you can't move, you can't go through a huge assessment. If you can't just stand up, right? There's, there is like your assessments. You can't get your ass out of that chair, I assume. And it hurts like it hurts bad or stares, right? So it's very simple. And to an athlete, and, and I've had different athletes call me, and I guess I have a different point of view. If you're still playing football, I kind of say, do you really have a bad back? Like, do you really have a bad back? Like, I've seen bad backs who can't move. Like, to me, that's a bad back. I have weightlifters. I'm like, got a bad back. I'm like, eh, eh. You squatting still? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I, I don't know if it's really a bad back. I mean, it hurts, <laughs> but the mere fact you're doing that, I don't know if it's really bad. I think your programming is bad, right? I think I think you keep making the same mistakes that you're not going to help yourself with that. I mean, we're all the worst. It's funny, you you we all we all make our own. Like Buddy Morris is notoriously stupid at fixing himself. He's horrible. If there's a list of what not to do. <laughs> And the list of what to do. I can tell you what list he hangs out on. He hangs out on the do not do list, right? They all do, right? But when he's working with other people, they're over here in the do not do list. So people can't follow their own rules. Like, I'm smart. I follow my own rules. The rules of Michael Hope. That's why I never had back surgery. Don't want a rotator cuff repair. Now, sure, am I feebly, feebly weak? Absolutely. You know that? Brother. I wake up every day. Okay. Like I know both arms go back. I can lift. I'm healthy. I, can, I used to laugh. I talked to Dave Tate and those guys. I'm like, you guys are never throwing a baseball to your kids. Never. You're going to have cardio. You're going to be a cardiovascular issue. You won't be going upstairs. No, you look good and you're strong as hell. But for the love of God, you guys can't, you can't hold on to a bar. Right. Well, and so it's just kind of, I, I you know what I mean? So they can't get out of their own ways. Did did I ever tell you the the time I worked out with Buddy out of out of pit? So like Buddy Buddy was my I, I mean I idolized the guy bef yeah. before I went to pit, and so anything he said I was like yes I yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir. So one day uh, he goes, "Hey motherfucker, what are you doing? You're coming to work out with me at my gym. I'm taking to a real gym." I'm like, "Oh, oh yeah. okay, cool, awesome. Like let's fucking do gun show. Let's do this." So we go there. And I'm fresh off of shoulder surgery. I had shoulder surgery in like, I don't know, July or some shit. And I had a whole posterior capsule repair. They, they had to sew the shit up. I, I think I had a partial thickness tear, hill sacs lesion. My shoulder was fucked up. Uh, this, and this was in maybe September or October. So buddy, buddy gets on to the Smith machine, his favorite Smith machine, gets on the incline bench, and the motherfucker takes his arm at, because he can't reach back and he attaches it to the one <laughs> one hand of the Smith, one part of the Smith machine. He goes on. He starts, ah, 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 and he's doing his reps. He racks it. I looked at him. I was like, dude, like I, I just had shoulder surgery. I can't do this shit. And he looked at me. He goes, you fucking serious? I'm like, all right, I guess I'm fucking doing. I guess I'm doing fucking shoulder presses on the fucking yeah. Smith machine. <laughs> he. I, so I used to go to Buffalo. We'd work out. Dude, he spends more time warming up with heating pads on. I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta work out. Like, like, I live a life. I'm on, I'm on a clock. 
right? <laughs> and and so it's just like you're too like love of God, man. No one can go that. It's like each set's like another warm up set, another warm up set. You're like, are we are we ever gonna work out? <laughs> so it's funny. It's funny. I met Buddy. I was I was God. I was probably 15, and and so I used to hang out with his older brother. Well, his young, who's older than me, but his younger brother. His younger his brother got in trouble. My dad was a narcotics agent. Had to get him out of trouble. And part of the penalty was his brother had to take me to go to the University of Pittsburgh when he worked out. So it was like the <laughs> trade off. My dad got him out of out of bad problems if 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 he would babysit me. And that's when I, that's when I got first introduced to go into the weight room. And I remember I was a little kid. And at that time, I think Billy Frelick was there. And and at that time, he was like an Adonis for football, right? He and I was looking up like I never seen anything that big or that like like a godlike st structure, right? He, I think he's recently passed away of cancer. But he was like my first like oh my god moment when I was a little kid, and um, and and so every once in a while I'd go back to the pit and I would they would bring like certain like Steelers would go there to work out so I'd go back and I would I would they would tell me their problems and I would try to reprogram their stuff right and it's funny how many I laugh how many people I've worked with and no one knows who I am I treated like guys call me I treat I fix many athletes they don't have a clue who I am but he'd always give me these clothes right and he you know, I'm like. I'm a normal human being. Like he'd always give me shirts I couldn't wear. Almost make me look <laughs> inferior because I'm going to work out. Like my shorts were too big, my shirt was too big. I'm like, do you guys not like make mediums here? Like there's no medium in this place. And so, so, so you you learn what not to do. I mean, I think the takeaway from him is like what not to do. I I one time I went down to Elite Fitness years ago, and that time um, Dave Tate just had a total hip replacement, and. Uh, uh, he's a, he's a famous, he's out of Chicago powerlifter. I forget his name. We were talking, he blew his quad tendon out in a video one time. Um, Oof. he's about, he's, he's, he's like, he's like a God of powerlifting too. I, he was there anyway. They both had total hip replacements and, um, um, uh, oh, shit. he's Andy Cohen, Andy, uh, Eddie um, Cohen, Ed Cohen. Eddie Cohen, right? So we're talking and and like Tate's in the corner, like he's leg pressing a thousand pounds, right? With his total total hip replacement. I was like, like it's great, but you know what? That thing's not gonna last. Like you can do that. Andy Cohen showed me the video of him walking out of surgery, and he had it done, I think, in another country because they're they're more waxed on the roofs, right? And um and he'll do great. And I'm thinking, but only for so long, right? I mean, the rules of destruction will kick in. And so when I would treat some of the, the power lifters who eventually would blow their backs, have back surgery, it's funny, back surgery does make you wake up sometimes. And now you decide, oh, maybe I'll listen, right? But I used to say to these guys, like, like you know, I went to see so-and-so and, -so and I, I was supposed to have back surgery and he fixed me. And then like my take is, eh, you probably didn't need surgery then. Like the people that I've seen go to surgery, like nothing, nothing, nothing works. So you just got better. And that's okay, that's a great thing. Like I tell people, I'm not that magical. Like you probably should have not been going to surgery. And if I got you out of surgery, you probably shouldn't have been going anyway. It'd have been a mistake, right? You, maybe you wouldn't have got better. Um, and, and I think that's definitely in the spine. That's, you see that a lot in the back, right? Cause yeah. it's, it's so unknown, right? No one, no one knows the spine. Um, I think Alf Nockamson, who retired from, from years ago, I think his last address they said to the Americans, uh, American Spine Society, I think. So, he, so Nockamson is the study that everybody knows. You just don't know you know the study. And the study is, you know, when you lay down, you know, you have back pressure and you bend your knees and put them on up. Like, that's Elf Nockamson. He did all these pressure studies in the disc, right? So everybody knows him. They just don't know he's the guy. And I think he said, I know no more now how to treat a back than I did when I first started. Because we have two things we do for everybody. This, basically, a discectomy and infusion. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all we, we still are at that point. And so when I first started, there was like chymopapin that you would put into people, try to eat up the disc. That didn't work. We did eye dents. They would basically try to shrink the disc. That didn't work. And so we're still, I mean, we have, we have disc replacements now, and I've seen some of those, and they're like okay on some levels. But, but for the most part, you're still getting two things, right? The discectomy and the fusion. So like he said, we've not, where all the total joint guys are happy and everybody's successful and they love their doctor, the spine guy still walks in and goes, not better, right? So, so that's, a tough, that's a tough group of, group of people to work with from that standpoint, if I didn't get off track there. But, <laughs> but, but, but right, because but what happens is you hear people and you think they fix everybody. 
Mm -hmm. I should go see so-and-so. He's really good, right? And I'm like, listen, I got a lot of failures. But I tell my patients, here's the deal. I may not help you, but that's the best thing I can tell you. I won't help you, and it won't cost you a lot of money to find that out. I'm not going to drag this out. Because if you can't do the simplest, the simplest of things, you have to reconsider, is this the right path? And I say that with shoulders, like I have shoulders who come from far distances to see me. And if you can't, like, I, I, there's, I always kid around with my kid at work, so I call it the Michael Hook criteria. If you, if you hit the Michael Hook criteria, you go to surgery 100% of the time. You always go to surgery. And, uh, and he always laughs. He goes, that's just not reliable. I'm like, 100%. I've never been wrong. And my <laughs> criteria is, if you come and you've had, we'll say, a year of constant pain, one, if you lay on your side and you pick your up five times where you can go that kills and you do this and you're like and you can't do that at home if i tell you all you can do is every two hours you can do five of these and you come back you go my arm's worse invariably they'll go to surgery and there's always something wrong but even but the mri didn't find it right because that's they're not 100 percent, right so sometimes the best test is you have to go in and look at the joint so i think people are scared to say you need surgery or need injections but they're a very common common reality with with people right i I've talked to many athletes who when I was one elite fitness working, and I told a lot of them to get an injection. You try back, you know, try injection. Shoulder's a little easier than a spine injection, right? Because, you know, it's a little less, it's more pal pal palatable. When you like, I can take that needle versus the spinal injection, right? People are like, that's just that's too much of a leap. Especially men. Men don't like injections. Women, epidural makes sense to them. Like, oh, that's all it is. You're like, yeah, go have one um, to do that. But I, I think it's okay to tell people to get these things. Um, if, if you think you've given the best course of care and you, and you think you gave, like I tell my patients, like I did the best I could for you. And, and people say, like, why am I still in therapy? I'm like, that's a great question. Why are you still here? Because people come in with you, they're all gone. And I say, listen, I, I'm not the best, but I know one thing, if you're still here, we're in trouble. I can't help you. I know your MRI is, isn't, isn't, says nothing's wrong, but you're better off having someone scope you and just look because this is, you're going to be this way for the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And, and so, you know, I'm not delusional with all this and, and I've gotten much better. I used to be dogmatic when I was younger because I used to read all the research, like, like you do acupuncture, right? So, so you have, so like when I was younger, like, you know, I came out of a, of a, of a clinical, there was all, all all, all research. So, you know, when people say, I'm going to do this, I'm like, you know, it's just wasting your time. But now I say, listen, if you think that works for you, have at it, do it, right? Do whatever you think makes you feel better. And then we'll just do stuff together. The more money you have, the more you do. If you're a pro, you do everything because you can afford it, right? But you don't even, you don't even know what works. But you're as a pro, you ha every training team has to do that. Because if you're not, your player feels like you're failing them. Mm -hmm. Right. I, so, so I had a company call me in China. This is funny, right? So they want to put American physical therapy in China because they're happy with what they have. And they have like, I think a 10,000 patient hospital, like a 10,000 patient hospital. Like we have 400 bed hospitals here. So you think about what a, a 10,000 facility is, right? And they're, they're contacting me about putting a program together for post-operative, like total shoulder replacements, total hips, and all these things. But it's funny. You're never happy where you are. Because we're like, whoa, give us, what do you have to offer us here? And they're like, hey, we want to be Americanized. So we want American protocols. We want to know, you got braces? Like we have, I have a friend who has a brace company in China. Like, we need some of those knee braces for our people now. So you're like, oh, like, so it's, it's a reverse, right? They're trying to move more toward of a, of a durable medical goods supply now. Because they have, I think, I think like it's healthy China by like 2030 or something. They're new. new new movement. We started doing that, but then, then obviously this is not the best pork right now. It's China. Right. So, so with the virus, everything's been put on hold, but I find it ironic. Now they want to be American um, with their, or some of their care, right. Cause their athletes have never had exposures or some they're, they're very, it's funny. They're very limited, great population, obviously, but access to like what we can normal sports medicine or strength training, like you guys, very few people actually participate in that. Because they're sore. A lot of people have surgeries and they're in their surgery center out the door, total knees. You mentioned just, they're just kind of walking out the door. So, yeah, so it's funny when I got contacted to do that. Um, 
yeah, it's, um, you're never happy, never happy. Yeah. With all that. So Michael, what's your, what's your opinion um, and experience on yeah. um, the input of now the popularity, sorry, of stem cells? Do you see there being a, a lot of positivity regarding them? Cause I, I've we, heard mixed we, stuff. I think it is. I, this is, this is what they'll, what they tell doctors in the private sector. This is a great cash making business, right? That's, that's what they never said. This is a great helping pay business. It's cash flow. So here we have, we have like people who do spinal, uh, spinal care will do cells in knees or shoulders, whatever walks in the door. If there are criteria, you, you don't get better and you have, what is it? A minimum of $1,500 in your pocket. If you got the $1,500, you, you get the stem cell. I'm exciting if it works. I just, I just, um, I, I feel bad for some people. I think they're desperate and they they don't have a lot of money. And and he, I know locally here that they give it to them, and and the outcome wasn't what they'd wish for. And I, I think that's the sad. Thing. Buddy who had some and he did okay for a while. The total knee replacement. He was young. He was 43. He had stem cells done months, a little longer. He felt okay, but eventually he needed the replacements. And it would be nice to see if you could, like you said, grow the cartilage back, turn back the hands of. Um, with uh, I worked with uh, um, some guys in the NFL. I mean, they have access to that. They, you know, like when they go to I think Germany, you get their PRPs done that are that are heated versus America where you don't. Um, and and they they come back and they rave about it, right? And and so here we have an FDA approved that I guess. So I don't I don't know the greatest answer for that. I know that a lot of athletes I've trained will always tell you they feel better on drugs, anabolic steroids, right? They seem to like that as far as the recovery, their ability to fit. Um, we, we, like I said, local, we hear the doctors, it's really hit or miss. And they do it. Sometimes insurance companies won't cover, they'll cover like the first injection, will come or they'll cover blood injections. And then, then they may or may not cover PRP. So stem cells is really becoming a, a way to make money inside of encyclopedic or orthopedic practice, right? So I wish I wish that wasn't the case that it's that, that it is that's the selling point, but we we don't I mean which community here, so I haven't seen a lot of them. I mean, what 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 do you see? Like the people come to you and say, "This, this is the best thing I ever did," right? So, um, so with with the stem um, cells, I there there were a couple of things that I've I've seen with stem cells that I didn't like. Uh, one, I think there was some research that I saw that if you have multiple spinal taps uh to get the stem cells like they, they'll drill into your hip to get the bone marrow and if you have more than one it increases the likelihood of you developing dementia by like 80 percent i saw that i was like well i don't fucking like that yeah. I, and and yeah. i always think you're robbing peter to pay paul in one area or in one way or another if you're taking bone marrow out and you're putting it somewhere else like well you, you have the bone marrow there for a fucking reason Right, and unless this is like extremely urgent, you're you're taking you're robbing one area of your body to to feed the other, and and even though it's going to regenerate, it, it still doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. Um, there's there's another doctor. Uh, I ended up talking to the the creator of the the biomed company, yeah. uh, just because I was able to name drop, and they found a way to extract stem cells from umbilical fat. So they, they take umbilical fat and they figure out a way to get the stem cells out of it. And they can culture I, I, hundreds of millions of stem cells versus yeah. uh, extracting from the bone marrow, which is only hundreds of thousands. And then you need to add in growth factors and all this. So the reason sure. why, and, and then what they do is they, they inject it intravenously versus uh, localized. So what they found was when they were, the way it was explained to me was one of the reasons why localized stem cell injections don't work is because stem cells, the first things that they touch is what they mimic. Um, and, and, and this is, again, this is the reason why the spinal, the, the hip taps, the, the bone marrow uh, stem cells aren't that great is because when you're drilling, what gets in there? Osteocytes. So then the stem cells start mimicking the osteocytes and then everywhere you inject it, you develop fucking arthritis. Um, then on top of that, once it hits 
that area, where does it go? It goes to the blood. Where does the blood go? The lungs. So everyone's lungs start healing up, but it doesn't necessarily help the localized issue, right? So it'll help you systemically. It won't help you locally. So what this other uh, uh, doctor or, or the, the biomed company uh, was telling me what they did was they saturate the blood, they saturate the lungs with intravenous stem cell injection before localization. So first, they'll inject intravenously, and that way, systemically, you have stem cells hitting the system and saturating it. And it's like, all right, well, nothing needs to go to the lungs anymore. And then they say, all right, well, now that we've kind of like hacked hacked the system, now we can go locally and it'll all stay there. So that's, and I... Uh, originally something like that had originated in Europe. So I had a couple of guys go over to Europe to get that done and they, they seemed happy with it. And now it's, they, there's a guy in, in Jersey that actually does it. And there's only five people in the country right now that are doing it. One of them is located in, in New Jersey, but I, as far as results from it, fuck if I know, uh, theoretically that, Hey, that, that makes sense. Cool. That, that, that could, that could add up, but now, my, my other thought process, again, too, is, well, if you extract it from the bone and osteocytes get in there and it mimics bone, then you're extracting it from fat. Why the fuck won't fat cells get in there? And why won't it, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Why won't it mimic fat? Like, why? And I asked the guy, he goes, well, it just doesn't happen that way. So he didn't really give me that much peace of mind on it and that much, like, uh, sure. Why the fuck not? It's still a new frontier. Does it work? I saw on Joe Rogan, it does. You know what I mean? But yeah. other than that, I don't, I, I, I can't logically make too much sense of it more so than anything else. I think a lot, I mean, it, it's just so exciting when you hear about it. And so the question is, do you do it early on? And they first have him wearing symptoms, right? Especially we'll say the knee or the, or the, the shoulder, right? Do you wait till it gets at a midpoint or the end game? Because the end game, we're always catching up. You know, it, 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 it's, you know, I talk to my buddies, like, they're, they're kind of like, there's like, like, we just do it when all these things don't work. And then we do it. Well, who do you do it on? Ironically, uh, the guy who has the credit card or the check that cleared. Like, not, you know, not the, the recipient who's most, who's most needing of it. The person who, who can actually pay for it out in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. He gets it. And so there's not a lot. So we don't have a lot of that, right? And, and you know, like you said, the, it's typically the athletes, right? The athletes get it. And. And they're, you know, I mean, they're good and bad because they're crazy, right? I mean, they're the placebo people. When you think about the 30% of everything you do makes you feel better, like that's the one group that you, that you have to do everything for because they don't know what's not working and what is working. So, you know, did you ever, you remember years ago, God, Charlie, I think it was Charlie Stan, Stan Staley out of Vegas, S-T-A-L-E-Y, strength coach. Right? You, you got to go back. You guys were really little. So Martin Rooney had him talk up at, up at, uh, up at, in, in New Jersey, right? So I was there and he talked about athletes, right? And so he, I think he wrote an article and he talked about taking a protein suppository, right? So he said, listen, you know, if you use a suppository, you have faster absorption, faster absorption, this faster recovery, and then faster, faster, uh, re regeneration of strength and size. But he did it as a joke. And he goes, the sad part is how many people call to order a suppository of protein. So you're like, that's not the target audience you should probably be trying to do research on. Yep. Right. So, so, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm always fascinated by sports because it's unlimited access to cash. Right. So that's, that's what I think is amazing. And, and I think you guys too is sometimes when you, when you, when you see an athlete, you're kind of almost also let down how not athletically great they are as far as exercise or how oh, not yeah. strong they are. So you think, oh, yeah. oh my God, you can only improve with me, but it shows what talent can do. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't, you know, you can't make someone skillful at hitting a ball, right? That's really hard talent. But when I, when I, when I watch well, certain athletes I've worked with, I was like, well, I think I'm like better. I think, I think I'm better than you, right? But I can't do what you do, but I know I'm like, dude, if like <laughs> we got a contest, like I could do all these things better than you. And I, I think that's always what would fascinate the average person about the athlete sometimes, right? What, what, what in a weight room, I'm just I'm saying just from purely a weight room, yep. right? Watching them coordinate or stand on single leg, right? And I look, I'll forget my little dog. Or, so one of, the, one of the stability tests, like in the, uh, the screening was like, remember, we all do the arm and leg, right? And the other ones, you do the same side, right? You, you stay, you know, for rotary stability, right? I remember my daughter was like five. I had her like on her hands. And I said, hey, just kick your arm and leg out. She didn't know better. Puts out the left arm, puts out the left leg. She doesn't fall. 
So she would pass the test. My daughter, I don't think she has the greatest rotary stability, right? My son's three and a half. My son's a champ. Because his femur's that long. Like he can squat to the floor. He loses and he can reach because he's three and a half, right? <laughs> and, and when my daughter was that little, she could do it. So it's funny. I've watched certain things that people talk about with my kids, right? And I know that my, my son has great movement patterns because he's still low to the ground. My daughter's time, she's lost those abilities, right? She hasn't had to do them. She can't squat to the floor like she can't do rotary tests like she used to as she's grown up and, and matured. And so when people say like, you know, like, like the overhead test and all these things, I've yet to meet a lineman who can do the overhead squat. None. And, and I don't know how important that is when they pass pro. Of course. You know what I mean? And, and so that's why I think I've, I've always shot away from testing because I, I, I think the best, I think the test sometimes is when you look at the person do it or, or some of these things, right? If you play sports, I mean, the loss, are you going to get hurt? This is how frequently and how short in duration is, is, is your downtime going to be, right? And that's always our goal in athletics is to minimize downtime. That's, that's all we think we do. I have, I have patients who call me all the time. And they're like, listen, my, my son just got hurt. I'm like, how many, how many, two days? I'm like, just wait, seven days. You'll be amazed what seven days, right? We'll do it anybody. Yeah. So I don't, so I'm like, hey, do I see this and see that? I'm like, oh, for the love of God, stay at home and do nothing. And then tell me on day eight, how do you feel? And I had a buddy who used to work for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So if you hurt your ankle, they would put you in a, a brace and a tens unit. And what, um, what, uh, a tension, what's that? A, a tens, just an e stim unit, right? Put oh, a little stim okay. pad on you. So I said to him, I said, why do you guys do that? He goes, honestly, because they can't go out at night. He goes, so this way they're staying at home because we just need one day better. So instead of getting better on, you know, seven days, we need six. So six gets us to play on Sunday, seven gets us better on Monday. And, and so there was no science to it. It was just you realize you have to babysit an adult and can't let him go hurt himself. Mm -hmm. So he would, they would brace him and give him a tens unit, right? And um, it's kind of funny, but, but in the pros, that's, that's the things that, that, that do well. And one day makes a difference for these guys to, to play with all that, right? Yeah, so, it, yeah. It, you, with, you doing all those tests or your kids doing all those tests and your pros not being able to do it makes you really think, how fucking valuable are these exercises? Like, what the fuck yeah. does this even well, mean? You would probably agree, and anybody who works with athletes, there's certain things that are always going to be must do, right? There's certain exercises. I think if you cover those components with anybody, you'll probably have really good success. And then you have to get more specialized and more specialized, right? The higher the level, sometimes you think it'd be more specialized, but just show me what you can do, how you, what's, what's going on with your program. So I'm a big advocate of programming, right? That's my thing. How, tell me what you're doing. I'll tell you what, how I would change it and then incorporate it. So I, I tend to not go down. And, and I, I laugh how many people I treat on the internet. I have no idea what they move like. I don't have a clue. But just through programming, I help them. Now, there's nothing to be said for that. It's okay with videos and everything. You can help people now. That's, the technology has changed compared to when I first started doing this. So I, I, think it's, I think it's good. But I think if you truly just listen and you try to simplify it, you have more successes versus complicating it, right? With, with, with all those things. You guys have time. I mean, the average, the average visit in, in my hometown is $50, right? How much would you give, how much time are you going to spend with someone for $50? Like, you're just going to, I'll see you tomorrow. You're like, we, we just got started. You're like, yeah, but that's all the much, like my athlete came back. He was $200 visit in New Jersey, right? $200, right? If you looked at sports and it was in, in my hometown of a workman's comp injury, they would get $49, you get $49 a visit. That's what we used to get yep. for years. So when they yep. walk in, you think of, you think people are going to go through everything with this? And you're going to stretch them, roll them, stem them, heat them, frequency, all shot, rub them, exercise them, bring them back down, put them in a cryo cuff, turn around and put restrictive therapy, I mean, uh, blood flow restriction unit back on them. You only get $50. You're like, yep. screw that. You just won't. So, so with those guys, that's why you, why do you do so much? Cause you have to make it feel like you have a dollar value, right? But how much of that's really important? Like if someone said like, listen, here's the deal. I only got so much money in my pocket. What are you going to give me for my $50? Then you'll pick out the biggest banks, right? So I think when most people, if you think the biggest banks for your dollar, like with exercise and implementation, 
you'll do well. If you work with Kevin Love, I'm sure when Kevin Love came to see you, he's so, he, he could have been the most stably strong guy. But he could play basketball. But if you build upon some of that framework and add some stuff, like it has great carryover and his tolerance to take a beating. And isn't that what we're doing to these guys sometimes with athletes? Making them take a beating better. Yep. Resilience. We're making them resilient because the season's, the season's long, right? I tell people, like, I, I will, I'm never going to make you a better athlete. I just make you take a beating better. It wasn't coming from my strength background, right? So that's why I said to people, I take no value in your success, and I take, I take, I take no credit for your success because that means I have to take credit for your failures, right? So that means if you suck, everybody's looking at me like, you got to hurt. You're like, yeah, well, I didn't take credit when he did good, so I can't take credit when he did bad, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, but that's why, like, it's funny, like, I have – all the people, and it's different to have a clinic, right? I have no picture of anybody I've ever dealt with. I have no shirt, no nothing thing. And, and, I, and I think it came back from when I was younger, Mike Webster played for the Steelers. And I think someone said to Mike Webster, you never wear your rings. Why not? And he says, because I know what I did. I don't, I don't have to wear them, right? I don't have to show the world that I, I won five Super Bowls, right? So I think my clinics have nothing on the walls nothing and they're just like because they're people just like everybody else so it's kind of boring i'm not flashy but it's it's really weird that i i i like the people and i think growing up i had friends who played in the nfl so i was always around it it never really impressed me that much because that's a job it's all they do same as my accountant they just happen to do that one thing that that people revere so i've never i've never put anything up from the people I've ever dealt with. Yeah. I like them. I respect them. Yeah. Michael, going back, you mentioned about, um, you know, the certain amount of population that experienced the placebo effect. Yeah. What's also your opinion on different things such as psychosomatic pain? Do you have much experience with, with people like with this, like sort of psychological or emotional yeah. trauma? And they're just scared to do the movement, but they oh, can yeah, kind of yeah. do it. I mean. So, so there's, there's, a, there's a, I think it's a John Sarnum in New York who wrote Mind Over Back Pain, right? And so, so the book came out. And he's very selective in who he treats. And he treats them mentally. He talks them out of their pain, right? But he, he, you know, he has a certain part population and that. So, so I had a girl one time. She was, she was in, I think she was 24 years old. She dropped out of college. She drove in the backseat of her car and, uh, for back pain. And she came to see me. And I really, I, I said, there's nothing wrong with you. I said, just go read this book. And it's funny because I was like, you know, maybe because I wasn't any good to figure out what's wrong with her. I said, just try this. Read this book and we'll talk on Monday. It was Friday. She comes back on Monday. She goes, best book I ever read. So then she sends me a card. She, she did a marathon and it was just like, it's like, you're okay. Like you're, no one dies from this. And, 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 and so I tell my patients, there's time when I, there's times when I'm, I'm your cheerleader and there's times when I'm your devil's advocate. And so, I mean, uh, yeah. So what, when, so I think some people they've had it for so long. That's all they know, right? It's their lifestyle. So they say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go walk. I'm going to clean my house. All they think is that's going to cause that much pain. That's going to cause that much pain. So it's the center of all their life, right? Before they do anything, they think this is the repercussions of what I'm going to have. So I think from that standpoint is why I go much slower. And I'm like, listen, you okay? You will do these small things, right? And you, here's the deal. I guarantee you, you won't get worse. You won't get any better, but you won't get any worse. And worse is a starting point. And then we try to, to develop that, that confidence, right? And when they have successes, they start to buy into you. Mm. And, 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 but when they tell me they're really good, I say, well, why are you good? Because they have to justify that. Like I had a lady that I always treated, always fixed. And, she, and I couldn't fix her anymore. I said, I can't fix you. She had surgery. The surgeon who did her surgery said, you have to go to my clinic. She went to her clinic. I happened to see her grocery shopping. I said, how are you doing? She goes, they tell me I'm doing great. I said, I said, you, you, your goal was to walk the church. Can you walk the church? She goes, oh, God, no, I can't walk the church. Well, I said, why are you doing great? She goes, well, my therapist tells me how good I'm doing. I said, but you had surgery, so you could, you could go do that. She goes, well, my husband told me I'm no better either, right? So one person is telling she's doing really well, but if you objectify it, she's not doing well at all, right? So you have to be very critical. Like when someone says you're, I'm better, like I always say, like, tell me why. I feel better. 
that doesn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. Can you sit longer? Can you walk better? Right. And I think, so we take people, cause we want to tell everybody how great we're doing. And I think, I think we, 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 it's a lie. Cause you, you're so scared to say that you're not doing good for people. You, and, and I tell my patients, you go see a doctor and you say, how's it, you know, like I ask them, like, how's it going? They're like, I, I, I'm doing good. Well, if you have chronic back pain, there's, there's, there's miserable pain and there's, there's zero pain. They're always here. So if you say to them, how much, how much pain do you have? Like, oh no, I'm doing good. I'm like, well, how much pain do you have? And they're like, well, I always have pain. So for them, doing good is now just a, a little pain versus yeah. a lot of pain. So we always think zero pain. So I say, like, if you're, if you're, you're, if you're starting with constant pain, that means the things we do have to be less sometimes because we're just going to make you worse. So words mean a lot to me. And I always, I always tell my patients, I always kid around. I'm like, if you're pregnant, once you're a small bit pregnant, you're all in. You're 100 percent pregnant. So if you have constant pain, there is no zero. It's, it's all in, or you're not. Because if you're not, if you have pain that comes and goes, you should be easily fixable. That's kind of most people's agreement. Constant pain, you have to listen to the way it behaves when you do A, B, or C, what happens. So from those behaviors, you start to program what you're going to do with them, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's, so, so you have to know your starting point to go forward. But I think differentiating pain is very important. Like you said, there, every time they go see someone, I just get worse, I just get worse, right? So you have, I think in those people, you, go, you babysit them, you start out slow, and you, have, you find a success. Like, again, I just gave a lady two things to do. That was it, two baby things. But you know what? She did them, and she'll come back and go, I'm no worse. So the first therapist she ever saw, she will come back and say, you didn't make me worse. And for her, I will be a genius. But I say one day does not a recovery make, right? That just means I had a good day. If I can build upon that, she won't be great. Don't get me wrong. She's never going to be great. But if she can get around the house, she can stand or walk. Like If she can do these things, she'll buy into me. And then she'll start doing these things. You know why? Because they work. Would you do something that doesn't work? Would you pay for electricity if you like the switch? Turn the switch and it doesn't turn on. So why would you go to therapy or go see a strength coach? It's not improving you. Like you're just wasting your money. You're scared to tell them that this isn't working. And the person who's working with you is scared to tell you why you're, you're not any better. Like sitting on a heating pad, like people say, I feel really good on my heat. So the best I have to offer you is a heating pad. Shit, you may as well go home, right? After therapy, I feel great because I don't, they just put me on heat. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm critical of my own profession because I think if you're paying for it, you, you, should, you should expect more from someone and you should question them. And the person who, who's feeding you should say, my goal is to get you better as fast as possible or tell you I can't get better and save you money and stop lying to you and then be gone with you, right, with all that. But again, the, this is... This is the little world I live in, right? These are my four walls. Like I know Dr. McGill, like he, you know, he has a very extensive evaluation up to three hours, right? In the medical model we work in, that's, that's, that's impossible. You know, we see people for 40 minutes and we get $65, um, yeah, $65 for 40 minutes for an evaluation. We couldn't stay in business if we spent three hours, right? So what you have to do is take each visit and put all those parts of somehow an evaluation and a plan together to figure out what you're going to do, right? And so, so our, our model is very different than, you guys can do whatever you want. Like you can charge as much as you want. We're still, still under the guise of insurance cap and time, we're time-based care. So, so when people would come see me, I have to make sure I give them everything possible within that, that 40, 30 to 40 minute window, we'll say. And I think psychologically it's, it's being slow, being consistent and having them, they have to buy into you, right? Okay. That's the key is they always say, and people come to me like, I didn't want to come here. I, I failed therapy. I was like, I don't know you. I've never seen you. So how did you fail me? You failed those other people. So part of it is like, oh my God, he seems to, he's a little, little cocky. But I'm just trying to say, listen, I don't know if I can help you, ma'am or sir. I know one thing, I've never failed you. If you give me a try, I'll be the first to tell you that I will absolutely be the first one to fail you. And if not, then it went well for both of us. So I think honesty, right? And I guess the, this level of trust and report that you get to build with these people, even once you fix them up, if they ever have a future injury or they'll recommend you based on 
uh, their experience to their family or friends. I mean, my question to you is, do you do any marketing with your approach, with your sort of no, it's, no it's bullshit funny. approach? No. Yeah. I, I, yeah. So I have, I have never, I, I have, I have, I've, I've really, I've grown my, so we do about 30,000 visits a year in my clinics, right? I, I really never go out and do anything. I've never seen doctors. I don't, I don't, I don't try to market. I, someone just told me I should, I should probably start doing that now. Like I don't use the internet. I don't use Facebook. I don't use Twitter. I don't use Insta. Nothing. I'm a dinosaur, but I've been successful by treating other people as failures. Right. And you're right. So the word of mouth is it, it continues to grow. So my day is always full of people who know people or doctors. So you got to go see this guy. So the problem with that is I have to work every single day. Like, like I laugh at my buddies. I'm like, when do you write these articles, man? When do you talk? Like, yeah. My whole day is full of patience from start to finish, from eight eight o'clock till five or five thirty with no lunches. That's my whole day. And yeah. and so you're you're right. My my business model was poor when when I treated the people from like elite fitness, like I never charged anybody. Like they would always call me and I would give them all the advice. Like I tell them, I have, I have no magic. So if I have no magic, I can only, what I'm selling you isn't anything special. So if you have a conversation and I can help you, here's what I would do. And, and then, and the problem was it became more than I thought, right? I would wake up in my emails and I have all these like questions, questions from elite fitness questions, right? And I would try to answer them for them. Like, just call me, just call me. My secretary is like, oh, there's a power lift in Texas. You said to call him. Like, I don't know who that is, but okay. That's all the Franco's people. Just call me. Like I had a guy from Europe. I saw, like I said, he sent me an email. I said, I'll just call you. He's like, we're in the wrong time zone. I had a guy in the military. He's like, I'm like, sure you be in combat right now? He goes, a lot of downtime, a lot of downtime in the military. But what it was, I, I, took, I took pride in helping people who weren't being, being they weren't successful with either their approach or someone else's. So the money meant nothing to me. The good feeling of doing something that someone else, for whatever reason, wasn't successful at was what I really enjoyed. I prided myself on, on you know, for one moment, like saying, hey, I did a pretty good job that I helped some guy who's been struggling, be it in Texas or California or over in Ireland, and he's been doing stuff and he never got better. So that's why, like I even told Michael, like I would, I would want to go back and, like, I have no problem going back now and, and, and having people send me things. I'm like, I have no problem treating people. I call treating people for free, right? Just to see if I can do it occasionally, almost for my ego. I say, oh, can I still treat athletes? But I just, I think every once in a while, I just, I make money every day in a clinic. So I look at these people, their problems is just someone you try to help and see what, how good you can do with them. And, you know, if you do a good gesture, you know, that's a nice thing. And so, yeah, um, that's why I kind of like, people like yourself and they would send me some people. That's why I would never, so I felt awkward putting a price tag on it. And other people say, if, then you, then you devalue what you do, right? If you don't charge, you devalue. And I said, listen, I have four clinics that make me money all day long. Like sometimes I don't think I devalue when I have someone come see me. Like I tell him, I have people come from New Jersey and Canada. And I say, here's the deal. If you shut my doorstep, I will never charge you to treat you. That's what I tell them. If anybody like, I like, if you have a bad problem and you're willing to drive, I had a kid from New York come drive to see me. I've, 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 I was lucky enough to fix him. I'm, I would, I would never charge him because his, his, he, if he drove six freaking hours to see me, not for nothing. I'm like, dude, I don't know if I'm worth it. I wouldn't drive six hours to see me. <laughs> so there's no way I could, I would ever look at charging someone um, to do that. And so, so if you have anybody, I'm more going to try to help them because. Shove my doorstep. I'll give it a shot, man. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. The sweetheart of a guy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, that reminds me of the old school. I, I remember, uh, I think Tate, when he came to Elite one time, he and Wendler were sitting back and they were, they were, they were talking in uh, DeFranco's office and they were talking about how Louie would just uh, he would have his phone number on like the back of the back of the videotapes that he would sell on the VHS tapes or something. Someone would call us like, yeah, I'm looking for Westside. Yeah, you got Louie right here. Like, and he just yep. sit there and he talked to him for hours and he said, Louie, you cannot be putting your fucking personal phone number out here. But yeah. he just loved what he did, right? Yeah. And 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 Brooker Brooker asked me, uh, we we talk about this weekly, and I have a certain amount of money. I think that I need to make in order to be happy. And he says, all right, well, what happens when you hit that number? I said, nothing. My anxiety goes away. 
He said, well, what would you do differently? That's not a fucking thing. I'd still go to yeah. work. I'd, yeah. I'd still go. I, I, the only thing I'd do differently is I'd end up training people for free. I don't give a fuck. Like, this is what I do. And I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to be decent enough at it and, and like doing it. Yeah. My, I made more of my first job ever as a therapist than my parents ever made, right? So for out of the shoot, I thought I was a success. I'll never forget. My dad bought me a briefcase. I don't know if he knew what I did for a living, but anyway, I had a briefcase. I took a briefcase to work. <laughs> and my security code was one two five zero zero zero. And if I said to myself, if I ever made one hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year, I wouldn't know what to do with myself, right? I was like my wildest imagination. I'm making forty two thousand. I never, I don't know anybody rich. I mean, I grew up in a, in a poor world, right? All of a sudden, I never forget. Like my first time, I made one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. I was like, oh my god, like this is it. Like I reached my my briefcase goal, and um, so so I think I think. <laughs> I think because I have more than I ever imagined growing up having nothing that I'm fortunate. So I think that's why I like to treat like my, my pro baseball player. Like he goes, what do I owe you? I'm like, nothing. All right. It was a pretty <laughs> good conversation. Right. It was, he's looking at me like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm okay. Like I said, I own this company. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and so, so I, I would, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind going back and helping people, like the people that you deal with, the other people, and say, listen, uh, here's the stuff, send it to them, and if you can help you, we'll help you. And then maybe, who knows, maybe that becomes an offshoot, and I go back and, and treat people, you know, maybe a business out of it that's, that's reasonably, you know, priced or whatever. But, um, yeah, I, uh, like you said, like, what is the number that makes you happy, right? I guess... You know, I have a, a reasonable house and a healthy family. And, dude, I don't have prostate cancer at the age of 55. No, I think I'm okay. I have a good buddy more. So I'm going to come better. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll live longer than he will. Somehow. <laughs> dude, all those guys. Tay, Louis, Sim. All those guys that I, that I first started with, I'll be the last man standing. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So do you, have, do you have a system? that you put in place with all your therapists that you teach, that you teach them is, is we, there, we, we try to, right. So we try to, I call it tree, right. So the tree is, is like, you have, you probably have a tree just in terms, right. A tree is a, a model that we all start from. So if I call my other office, I'm like, this patient's coming over. I need a, B and C. And they're like, okay, I, I understand that because there's a, 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 a basic tree of, of talk, right. You can do things off of that tree. But you can't be so eclectic that I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. So you have strength, you have strength coaches, right? So within those coaches, you have some methodology that you all agree upon. Mm -hmm. Some will have, some will have variability, but with the most, but the most of it, you have a strength work or a dynamic that you have speed work. You all fall underneath that tree of of of, an, of a the reasonable people would agree upon is good. Yeah. And then I think you break down your your failures, right? I look at every athlete at the end of the year, like what are, you should be looked at from what you can't do versus what you can do. Right. So you, so you, when you look at all your kids, like, so all these kids will have speed work. And then you say, here's the deal. You're poor. You're poor at starting. You need this. You're poor at, at acceleration. You're poor. So each one will then have this little thing they have to do themselves. So when I look at my, at my, my people, like for certain shoulders, they should be starting here, going here, going here backs. If you, if you, if you can quickly fix them, and if you're not, you should go to this, this, and this. So there is some uniform language from place to place, right? Um, but it's like anything. People think, well, I should see you. And I'm like, you don't need to see me. You can go close to your home. It'll be fine. And it is fine because there's oversight. If there's a problem, they'll call me and go, listen, this is what's happening. It's not going well. What should we do? Or sometimes I'll say, you know what? It's just if you want, you can, I'll look at them for you. Sometimes they'll come on. I'm like, I can't do anything either. I, I think you just, you need this or you need that. But I'm, I, the, the, plan, the plan is good. It's just the outcome is going to be poor. And then we change it. And, and so I think, I think there, it's like a universal language. It's like if you talk to a James Smith or you talk to certain people, you all should speak a relatively same language that you can ask questions from so you can get answers from. Now, James, you'll never get an answer you understand. <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, I was going to say, yeah. there, there's no same language there. <laughs> but, you do, but you do think you're, you're talking about the same thing, right? <laughs> um, I, just, I just talked to him, and I told him, like, I have my, my little son. And uh, I love talking to him because he's so dang smart, right? And, 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 but you don't know what you just talked about. As he talked, and I just listened, and I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> And uh, I said something like to the effect of, 
did you like this or something? He goes, I tend to not uh, get excited about anything. That way I'm never let down. So I'm very like, whatever happens, happens. And I was like, I don't know if that's a great way to be or like a crazy way to be. But I'm thinking, I think I'm like him sometimes too. Like if you have no, ex I have no expectations. So then I can never be let down. I was like, I have to think about that for a while, James. I'll get back to you on that. But, but I mean, he, I mean, he made people rethink what, what they are, right? On some level. Um, that you're, that, so to the point where he just gave up. Like he, 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 he rethought it so much, he just fucking threw in the bag and said, I'm done with it. Right. Yep. With it, I always said to James, he never will. I said, I said, I said, if you ever wrote something that, that we could all understand, you would be like James Wentworth's 531, right? James had an amazing book and it was so simple, but that's America, right? So years ago, when I, I got with Eric Cressy when he first started, we were to, I, I had a conference. I think I brought Franco, Dave Tate came in, me. We we're trying to bring Charlie Francis in, but it was a, it was a sad thing, right? So, so I couldn't bring Charlie Francis in because he wanted mo money, right? And I say that like, I think it was Eric, Dave, Jim Wendler, Buddy talked, James talked, I think I did. So what I did is all the money I got in from the, from the, the course, I divvied amongst everybody equally. So it's like, I think you got a room, I think you got $1,500 for talking an hour, right? So I paid for your room, like 1500 bucks. So everybody got it. And so he wanted more, so I couldn't say, bring him in and then steal from you guys. So at that time, oh, Eric talked. I brought Eric in, right? And it was, and it, after we talked, it was so funny because Eric, Eric was, was just starting out. I, mean, I liked him. I thought he had really good ideas. I thought Eric was the first, what he was so smart is he took the research and the science that we all had and he gave it back to his community. And, and when he gave it back to him, he was the smartest guy in the room. And he was able to, and he took a strength background and, and took an orthopedic model and was able to, to, to do it very well. And he said, you know, he says, you know, we should write a book. And I was like, I was like, that's not my thing. That's too smart for me. I'm just, I sat down to write a book one time. I freaking sat at the computer and just kept staring at it. I was like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's done. I gave up. And he, and he was able, he was able to run with it. And, and he's done tremendous ever since. Right. But he, he bridged the orthopedic scientific model to the community. Right. And I laugh. It's like, there was a saying one time when I was in Pittsburgh, the guy's like, the teacher is just a guy who read the chapter the night before the student, right? You just got to be one day ahead of the people in the audience. Yep. And that's it. So if they never read the research and you're smarter than the audience. And I remember like hearing like Paula Quinn and those guys talk and, and, uh, and, um, and I was like, yeah, it's not right, brother. Like that's, that's not, not true. Like that's wrong. But the audience most part didn't know that. Cause I was, now I'm with a bunch of strength guys. Right. And, and so, but, but, it, it, it's true when 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 people hear someone then they want to change everything they want to change if you go to west side you, you've been successful i gotta be like west side and you're like i don't know you're successful maybe things you steal from west side a little bit right and that's what i think i have i have a toolbox that over time of 20 years just gotten bigger but i know when to use my tool i don't use the same tool on everybody hoping for a different outcome so so and sometimes the tool is the biggest tool i think is listening and common sense Right. And then you put your, then you put your stuff on top of that from your toolbox. I have young guys who call me and they tell me all the stuff they're doing. I'm like, I'm like, slow down, brother. I, I don't know what you just said. Like you did so many damn things. Like you don't even know which one, if you can even help someone. And, and, you know, and, and so I think that's why I struggle with young kids because they watch all the videos and they, that's all they do. They don't actually learn a craft, right? They don't know their craft, right? And so I think I was fortunate. I had to learn mine. Like when I was first starting out, like Kevin Wilk and a guy named Bob Mangine who ran the University of uh, Cincinnati Sports Medicine. Like that's where I started. So I would spend time with Mangine. I, when, I was, when I wasn't working in Pittsburgh, I would go there. And then Wilk was down doing all of his stuff. And then, you know, the timing was right. Orthopedics was infantile and they became athletes. And, and, and now they're just, they're famous, right? And then Ryan yeah. who works down there, and they, it's like the wagon. You jump off the coattails. And then you ride the wave of other people. I mean, did you ever think you'd be sitting here doing this, talking to making money off of the internet, like selling training programs across the world? Right. I, you know, like, so I always thought I, I would make money in my four walls, seeing myself, seeing the patient in front of me. Yep. So, so that's the way I always viewed the world. Um, and so I, in many cases, that's, I'm a dinosaur, right. When I see the world, I'm like that. You guys are just like, like, I can almost like laugh. You're like, dude, 
Yep. You're, 50, no. like, you're 55. Like, like, no, no, no. You, you, like your world's old. Like, you don't, you don't get this. Bro, we are, you're, I'm just, uh, I'm a country ahead of you. That's uh, <laughs> honest to God. Like, I am not far ahead of you at all, bro. Like, yeah. we, we, Brooker and I are absolutely, he, he's barely on social media. And the only reason I'm on social media is because people force me to be. Like I, yeah. I, dude, I am, I am, I'm fairly illiterate with a lot of things. So don't, don't, don't yeah. worry. You're not alone in this. It's, uh, it's interesting. I think, um, I, I think I, like I told you most of the time we always had, you know, especially therapists, right? You always have something to sell. So like I tell yeah. them, like, I have nothing to sell. Like, why do you want to talk to me? I'm not going to sell a book or a video. Like I have nothing to, nothing to offer you, you know, I, nothing. Like if you want help, like here's my phone number, call me, give you help. Like it's that simple, right? And that's, I still stand by that, you know, maybe, maybe one day someone will write a book and put my name on it and go, that seems reasonable. I'll sign that. Is that going to, is that going to make me money? I, I do though. It's funny. I, I, when I was talking, when I was talking to the, to the, to the, my, my professional baseball player and he was laughing and he says, why don't you make money off of this? I see. You know, it's funny. I said, I think I wish I, I think maybe when I was younger, I think for my family's sake, I would have done something to make more money. Right. So they have a greater, whatever fortune coming. I don't know. But like I said, I said each day when I had no needs, when I got up, like I had a reasonable car, I have health insurance, I have retirement. Like it seemed good to me. Like it never seemed like I had any something else to, 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 to pump it. Cause if you're busy every single day, treating patient after patient after patient, maybe that's the stupidity, right? You're working every day. That's your problem. Like, you're seeing work differently, but I'm like, how, how much that's the good as it gets. Yeah. Right. If you had a client over and over every day, like you look at your day, you're like, every day's full, every day's full, next week's full, next week's full. You're like, this is great. Like I don't have to go out and, and do other stuff. But a lot of people with COVID-19 start realizing the tele, the, 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 the telehealth will say, right. Or training from distant training became a very big vehicle to jump on and see how you can, you can use that as a, as a bigger platform to expand your, your, your content or your voice. And I think a lot of people have, even like from healthcare, they keep, you know, all the people start calling me, like, do you have my insurance company? You know, you guys can treat visits now or whatever through telemedicine. Then I had to call my carrier to make sure you, you know, you can legally do it. And it's funny if you, if you do it, you have to pay more insurance for people you don't see. It's kind of weird. So if I talk to you and treat you by, by insurance, it costs me more money in my healthcare insurance for my premiums something goes bad which you hmm. think would be cheaper since i can't really hurt you really check out you know if i can't touch you i can't hurt you kind of kind of but that's that's what they thought my premiums would go up to telemedicine right but um yeah i uh so yeah this is pretty fascinating i know i've given you no information whatsoever <laughs> anybody <laughs> to me. no it's just, zero <laughs> michael it's nice because you know you you give the aura that you're very fulfilled with your work you know and, I do. I uh, you job. seem, yeah, man, and you you seem really content and stuff. I got a question. What what do you enjoy doing, man? Like, what what makes you happy? Like, what do you what you do outside of work? It's, it's funny. So so when I turned when I turned fifty, I uh, I was watching TV. I was watching the Iron Man, and I was like, as I was laying on my couch, I said, I bet I could do that. So I did an Iron Man at fifty. I freaking died. Like <laughs> like I freaking bought a bike and I bought a trainer. So because I had a daughter, my daughter at that time was, well, she was like eight or whatever. So I would go in my basement, I'd pedal my bike for like an hour, go up and see how my daughter's doing, go back down, pedal my bike, come see my daughter. So I never really got to train. I rode on the road, I think two rides for like 56 miles. So the, all of a sudden the race day comes, now I have to actually go and do all the race. So I, I swim and I start having like chest pains, like a mile out, it's like I'm, like I'm <laughs> so, so I'm on, they have like these little kayaks if you have trouble. And I'm like, I'm holding on the kayak, talking to the guy. He's like, you gonna, he goes, you need me to like wheel you back in. I'm like, I'll be all right. I said, I just need to get my wits about me. So then I do my, like my second mile. I get out, I start biking. And because I only bike 56 miles around 80, 80 miles, my feet go numb and I have neuroma pain. I can't bike. So I have my feet out of my clips and I'm like biking on top of my clips. And then I'm like on the <laughs> side of the road. I got my feet up on ice. And then I, so the marathon part actually was the, the least painful. So I did four, I mean, people do the nine hours, eight hours. Like these, some of these guys are great. So I was happy. I did 14 hours. I spent 30 minutes not moving because of foot pain. I never, I never biked more than 56 miles. I never ran more than 16. So, so I was pretty happy to do, to do my Ironman. 
And um, so that was at 50. You're and, out of your uh, fucking mind. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, this is a long day, man. I, <laughs> like, dude, I have a video that I put on my phone just in case no one believes me, right? Like, I, like, I freaking play that. I'm like, because when you cross the finish line, there's a guy who announces, he goes, Michael, as you come, he goes, Michael Hope, you are an Iron Man, right? I freaking got my stop for my picture because I'm like, I will never do this again. <laughs> so, so I got a picture, like, stop, look good. And, um, and so I, would, I, I just started lifting again. Uh, and I have kids, I, I, I'm older, but I have a three-year-old son and a 13-year-old daughter. So it's funny. I get up in the morning, I have three dogs. So we'll run about five miles. I get home, get a shower, go to work and get home, play with my kids, put my son in the tub, put my son to bed, watch, well, watch bubble guppies a little bit, put my son to bed. And honestly, by the time I sit down, it's probably 930. If, if sometimes I'll go out in the, my garage and lift, go to bed and get up and repeat. So I don't really have downtime at, at this point, at this age. And my daughter now is involved in sports on the weekends. We'll go do stuff with her, with my son. But um, I try to stay. So so I don't have, well, you, when you people laugh, like I don't like to do articles or talk. I don't really have time to like sit down and do that because I'm always trying to, to stay busy with my family and or work. And I do my business stuff, the banking, my notes. I have patients I'll call at night if I miss them. Like I have, I got people today. I got a call who send me texts and emails. Dude, I give all my patients crazy my freaking phone number. So I'll call them today because one guy, one lady got hurt. She's an Iron Man. She's having problems. So I'll, I'll talk to her today and uh, do that. But I, I just started going back and lifting and um, and trying to get in shape. Uh, I don't know what. I'll probably do the Marine Corps Marathon. That was my, probably my goal. My dad was in the Marines, so I'd love to run the Marine Corps Marathon. If I get a chance, dude, I suck at these things. Don't get me wrong. Like when people say they do them, like I just survive them. Like I, I am by no means. Like my daughter said to me, what would you do if you're in front? I said, honey, if I'm in front, something bad happened to a lot of people. <laughs> or they're, they're about to lap you. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's so funny. Like, it's funny you say that. So I'm, when, I'm, I'm on my, when I was doing the Ironman, so I'm on a little tri bike and I'm pedaling and, and like I see like the same bike go by me. I looked over at the guy and I said, dude, did you bike a faster model than mine? Because like you have the same bike, but it just blows by me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, you got to pedal this thing harder. And I was like, it was, so yeah. it was humbling. It, it was pretty good though. Like to say, I said I did it. Like I, I can wonder about how many people that said they did an Ironman, right? And um, so I did Lake Placid, which is actually one of the harder Ironmans in, in North America. So I, I did that. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, so now that I'm older, it's funny. I have, you know, it's where everybody, their kids are out of their house. To think about it, I'm 55 I'm a three-year-old right like that's just not good you're gonna like, give yourself I, a fucking heart attack bro <laughs> dude, I, like I, I know and and so so it's it's fun because I think I can like now I can do the things with back with people because I was I'm content you know like my bills are paid you know I I, I don't my wife doesn't have to, I mean, she doesn't have to work because you know because I, I was frugal too like I never lived above my means with anything and that's why I think I can do things like when, when I go out and do stuff for free. Cause I think I, I was smart enough to, to not be stupid with, with what I, what I had, but I'm fascinated by uh, you know, other sports. I still, I enjoy watching. Like I'm, I'm fascinated by endurance athletes, people that can take pain, right? The runners, the, 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 the little, like the guys who do the tour, the tour de France. I love yeah, football yeah. cause it's violent. Right. And I, I, and you've been around them. How amazingly athletic these people really are. Yeah. Like that's what's just, what I don't think people grasp is like, you know, talented. I work with certain colleges, like I, like Syracuse university, when, when their athletes don't get better, they'll see me. And this is pretty, this is, I'll tell you a story. Then you can cut me off whenever you want. So I would treat track athletes. Some guys, I treated some in the Olympics and some of the, the tra who, were, who were pros, I guess now, but it's funny. So before I got there, they had a therapist who would do, who would do a lot of soft tissue work. Right. And they would outsource it. So when I came, they would come see me and I would just, I would put a program together with, with Frank Rizzo, who is now at the University of Iowa, Iowa State. But he's a, he was a track coach who knew, who knew strength training, right? He came out, he actually worked at the University of Pittsburgh too with a buddy. So we would just basically program their, their, their training program. So we, we would never let a kid though, they weren't allowed to have any soft tissue. They weren't allowed to have anything. All they could do is exercise or modify their exercise program. So they went for like seven to $10,000 a year to basically like hundreds. And we found was when we took them off of all that, they, they, the psychological dependency was removed because they never thought like, 
oh, I need this, I need this. All they knew was working with Frank Rizzo that the programming and changing the volume or the resting was the way they're gonna get better versus, you know, it's tight, like you need to this. So it's, it, when all the older guys got addicted to it, the younger guys never got exposed to it. So we had less injuries, less downtime, less money spent because we started taking away all the, these, these external components to that. And it was so it was a unique little, you know, I don't, you know, a, a study, I guess, on going back, we said about athletes and how they perceive things. Yeah. So when you take it away, they never know what is supposed to happen. And, and so, so Frank was, he was good because I was working with speed athletes and hamstring injuries. And there's, there was a lot of problems with hips and obviously hamstrings. And we found was coming out of high school. Most of these kids were still fairly weak, yeah. right? It was. So they were fast, but they couldn't handle they couldn't handle the the, the volume of running because now there's more collegiate and the speed at which they have to run because no longer the best, so the practice is harder. So when we start incorporating better, you know, control of their training modules, finding out where they were fairly weak and bringing that up to what we think was appropriate for what they needed, we were very successful at minimizing the injuries and and time time out of off the track field, which then I was fortunate to work with a girl who ran for for Ghana. And the same thing, we, we worked with her very similar and, and fixing some of her problems. We, and it was all through training, right? We never did any of the other stuff um, because she, at that time, I mean, she's a poor pro and she has no sponsorships. So, she doesn't have, so the, a lot of the treatment we, was based off of what I would do, what Frank would do, and there was no other interventions. So you'd be amazed how, much, how successful you can be if you take all those things away sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, be a minimalist, I guess, with that, so. Yeah. 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 I, I notice I notice a lot of those same concepts just rearing their head right through because uh, we're doing a lot of telehealth medicine right now yeah. with acupuncture. And I've had multiple people with plantar fasciitis or what they deemed as plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. and what orthopedists deemed plantar fasciitis and their physical therapist deemed that. Right. And I mean, we could call it whatever the fuck they want. These people were just weak. So, I mean, yeah. we, we could do the needle intervention or we could do acupressure, right? We could tell these people to do anything. And even if they came in to the, oh, we just lost you, Michael. I got you. I'm sorry. Okay. Hold on. There we go. There you go. And, and even, if, even if those people came into the clinic and we'd stick needles in them, I don't think they would have gotten nearly as better, uh, uh, nearly, uh, better nearly as quickly if we had done the needles versus the exercises that I gave them. Right. So, I mean, over telehealth, yeah. I, I essentially just gave them some tibialis anterior strength work and, and some, some other basic shit that for them to do routinely and they felt better. Right. So even, even though I have access to all these modalities, I can do the needles, I can do the stretching. I can do, I mean, a lot of it circled right back to, well, these motherfuckers just aren't strong. Yeah. It's sad. It's simple. <laughs> It's not make sexy. Any money being no. <laughs> yeah. uh, you better do more stuff, man. There's not enough. You, got, you don't got enough going on. These podcasts are going to go like this. You keep, you, you keep it simple. You like this. Uh, yeah. uh, you two uh, be looking at each other, going, "We ruined our careers." Yeah. We <laughs> Yeah, I was absolutely. I was thinking the same exact thing while I was saying it. I was like, "Well, I just cost myself more fucking money." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You better find a new niche. I hope you can mail dance, something like that. Get in shape. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got one last question for you, and then we're, we're yeah. getting you off the hot seat. How come you had kids so late? I, th I think I was always busy. You know what? It's true. I was always busy buzzing around and um, trying to get really good at my, my career. I was, yeah. When I was young, like, I, was, I was voracious on my reading and my mechanics and looking at articles and finding people and going to work with people, right? So my priority is always getting good at my craft. That's what I wanted to do. And, and, and I was, if I didn't have kids, I was fine because I was always doing something else, right? And, there, and so I had them, and I, I, truly, I truly enjoy them, right? And I, th I think just I was always just – I don't know. Like, it's funny. Like, I know buddies offer me jobs. So it's always – maybe I was always – malcontent like i was always gonna go there like i was gonna go to cleveland or i would i have people say listen why don't you come here and, and start to do something else so i was always like okay I, I can't be in syracuse i can't die in syracuse so i'm thinking i'm gonna be out of here soon and it didn't work out that way and and now it's great but um you know i've had people it's funny when people come they're like my one guy goes why are you in syracuse so i'm like oh, that's a good question right like you should be bought you should be where, where, the, where the cool people live right where you guys live 
And, but here I sit in the middle of no man's land um, <laughs> with people. Yeah. Oh, now, you're me, now you're gonna make me cry at the end. Because <laughs> of my bad decision making. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it just, it just wasn't the priority yeah. when you were, when you were younger, you just, just said, ah, fuck it. I'll have kids now. I feel like having them and I'm good to go. And you know, being older, like it's, it's nice. Cause I can blow off anything I want and go see my kids at school, blow off and take off with my son to stay at home with them. Right. So, it's, so working hard early, it's weird where other people would have never made, they would have, you know, struggled. I was always working now. I can, I do whatever I want. Like every Friday I'll leave early to come home and play with my kids. If my son's sick, I can, I can take off, right? I, I've never missed one of my daughter's school events because I'll leave. And they'll come up and hang out with me and, and, and the clinic. My, I made my daughter go to work with me on Monday because she's been stuck here. Like I drag her ass to work and make her work. She hates it, but she's, yeah. she's going to learn that work's important. And so it's probably, probably good. It's good for me, I think, because now I'm, 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 con I'm completely content. And, you, you know, it's funny when you're young, you wear T-shirts of all the things you did, right? When you're older, you just wear what your kids do, like, like my daughter goes to Baldwinsville High School, so I'm like Baldwinsville volleyball. Like I'll be wearing stupid shirts of all her <laughs> stupid events versus they're always mine when I was younger. It was always a cool thing of what I did. And that doesn't that doesn't mean anything to me anymore. It's now it's with the stupid stuff they do, I guess. Michael, so, I've got yeah. a little girl. I've got a little girl on its way. It will be my first child at the end of God October. Bless you. you got any uh you got any bits of wisdom for me, my man? You know what? I, this is, I hope my battery doesn't go dead, but here's what I would tell you to do. This is strange. And this is, this is, I, I wish I would have done this. I had kids late. My parents, my dad had passed away uh, probably 20 years ago now, 21, right? And my mom passed away, I think three years ago. I wish I would have had conversations with my parents about what it was like to be when I was little. I know that doesn't sound, that sounds like people take it for granted. Like when I lay in bed with my son and he's, I'm going to cry watch, when he's sick. And I think how much my mom really did for me when, when I'm sure she laid there many hours when I was sick and, 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 and had, a, had an upset stomach or I was throwing up. And I never really appreciated what she was as a mom or my dad always having to work or come home when he was tired and playing with me, right? I never had that conversation of, like, tell me what I was like when I was a kid. I mean, you hear randomly, right? But I think, I think now I'm looking like to hold my kids and, and go to bed with them and put them down and talk to them. I hope my, I would say, I hope my parents had as much fun with me as I had with my, my kids. And I wish I had those conversations with my dad and my mom about the things that I did when I was little. And, and God bless them when, when we were up. Oh, we had three of us. I couldn't imagine we had chicken pox how little my parents got for sleep and and just really understand that because I, now i i understand the sacrifices i just don't have the conversation and i'm sad i really I, my dad died of cancer and and i was always working right i would i would and and so and i think my dad my parents would my, my parents would have loved my kids but i, I it's so funny you say that because i think all the time when i'm with my my kids like god i wish i could talk to my dad and, and say, I hoped, I'm sorry. I hoped oh, you enjoyed, good, man. I, I, I hoped you, you had fun watching me play, or I hope I made you smile and laugh like my son does, right? When he does stuff and he does these funny things. And I'll, I'll never know that. And I wish to God, I, that's the only thing about having kids early. I would, I would love to have the conversation and, and just know that, that they did enjoy me. Ah, shit. <laughs> that they truly, that they that they truly enjoyed me, for being for, for them being my parents and me. So if I if I say anything, God bless you. But make sure you ask your parents, like like, well, how bad was I? Or how good was I? And did I make? And were you happy? Did I make you smile? Did you laugh when I was do these things? Because I would love to tell my dad. I hope to God, my son makes me laugh and think, and my daughter does. That I I never ever had that conversation, and I wish to God that's the one. I could tell my parents, you know what, I, I truly do love you and I truly do thank you for how much you did when I was little that I never knew until I had mine. And the sacrifices, my parents were poor, like we lost everything. When my dad came home every day and didn't have a job, he would say we just try to find a job. He never hollered at us, he was never mean to us. And I think, I don't know, I have a house and kids and after COVID people losing jobs, I don't know how my dad did that. Like he was never mean and the stress he must have felt like I, now, now I would love the conversation. Go, I can't believe 
how good you were when things were so bad and we were getting our cars repossessed and my house had a for sale a, a foreclosure sign in the front yard. But you were never mean to us and you kept trying. And, and it's sad, right? It's, it's sad that, that that's, so if I tell, if that was the one thing I would say, please for a little, like, ask your parents, tell, tell, tell my kids or tell me how I made you laugh when I was little in the stories. Yeah, I always thought I'd have that conversation. I never did. Yeah. Wow, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very, God very much. God bless you. Yeah. You'll, <laughs> be, you'll be more than happy and more than sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry. For the first time you have a podcast, I'm freaking crying on it. <laughs> no, dude, yeah. you're good. Bro. You're fucking so good. Bro. So, so good. Yeah. Okay. Michael. I hope... I hope you liked it. Thank you, guys. It was it was nice. To, yeah, to, what a pleasure. To have a conversation. Bro. We we yeah. fucking Thank appreciate you, you and Thank your you. wealth of information and experiences so much. You have no idea, bro. You Thank are, you. bro. You're 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 what we aspire to be, man. Like you just got to me. To me, you're a dude with shit figured out, bro. Uh, honest to God. I hope. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. This was nice. I can do this again. Just for you don't have to record it. It was just nice to talk to someone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Now, where are you right now? I'm in Switzerland, mate. Okay. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a so bit your, different your time, now. But... As I say, yeah, yeah. Your time difference right now is so we're six two hours here. ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we got lovely weather right now. It looks like the same as in your back yeah, garden. We do. We're about almost ninety today. Yeah, so it's pretty. And so we're yeah. gonna go out and do stuff um, with my kids as soon as I'm done with this. That's cool. I can't, yes. thank, I can't thank you guys enough. I, I, this was, this was great. I, I, yeah. Dude, oh, we love, we love having it's you. It's our pleasure. Yeah. yeah really. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay. If, um, if you want, if anybody wants help, you, know, can you, you can give them my email. Uh, you know, no, I'm not putting, I, no. I'm not putting your fucking email out on this. Absolutely not. You're overwhelmed enough as it is. If, if there's something that's extenuating circumstances, then, then maybe Whatever I'll pass it forward. <laughs> Whatever you guys want, I'm more than help, happy to help you with. Okay. Michael, thank, thank you, you so much. Very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You, you too, too buddy. All take, the best. Take care, you guys. Thanks. Cheers, man.